Welcome to the Brilliantly Resilient Podcast. What's your train wreck? Everyone has one. The question is, are you going to live there or are you just visiting? Let's check in with Mary Fran and Kristen to learn how to come through not broken, but brilliant. Hey everyone, before we dive into this week's episode, we have a resource that we wanted to tell you about. Transform every week of yours with our brilliance bit that will deliver right to your email inbox. Sign up for it at brilliantlyresilient.net and keep living brilliantly resilient. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live. I am super excited today to have our guest, Dr. Greta Euling. Greta is a Dr. Euling. I'll use the formal title. Dr. Euling <laughs> is a professor at the University of Michigan. And Dr. Euling has written a book entitled Everyday War, which deals with the conflict in Ukraine and how ordinary people are affected by these extreme circumstances and how they have managed to uncover their own resilience and brilliance within those extraordinary circumstances. So Dr. Euling, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited for this conversation. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. So you walk me through how you did this because you're, this started with the conflict and the, is it the Donbass? Am I saying that correctly? Mm -hmm. The Donbass region, which was prior to the current war, was that annexed by Russia? Clear me up on some of the details there, because I know this is a bigger story than most of us know. Right. Yeah. Um, it's I think it's advisable to divide the war into two phases. Basically, the first phase starts with the occupation of the Crimean Peninsula in the south of Ukraine in 2014. And then with that having been accomplished, uh, Russian forces moved into the eastern part of the country where uh, a military conflict ensued. That was the first eight years. And then beginning in February 2022, of course, we have this full scale uh, Russian aggression that has essentially uh, involved all parts of Ukraine. Um, and it's really since February 2022 that we call it, you know, a war. Mm. But prior to that, it was, we just didn't seem to recognize it as such because it was more um, insidious, um, subtle, at least to the rest of the world. It mm. wasn't this all out assault that we're seeing now, but but these people have been undergoing this in some form or another, for years. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So how does that change the mindset of people living in those conditions? And, you know, we talk about resilience and the, the, the worldview of resilience since the pandemic has changed because we realize that we all need this skill but this is a group of people who have had to rely on this skill for a very long time. So how did you, first of all, how did you embark on this and this make this a point of study for you? And you went to Ukraine. So, you know, your own resilient story is involved in this too. So yeah. kind of lead us through how you decided to to make a study of this and, and where that took you. Well, um, you know, it's really interesting because it involved sort of a, a career, a career train wreck um, <laughs> or a, a, a train stoppage. There's uh, always something, isn't there, that makes you is. go in those directions? There is. You know, I had uh, really wonderful career uh, experiences working for the UN Refugee Agency in Geneva, Switzerland, and then um, working with an NGO in the United States in Washington, D.C. that was assisting child survivors of human smuggling and human trafficking. But what I really longed for was the freedom and creativity to embark on a creative book project. And in order to do that, I went back to academia, getting the position I have now at the University of um, Michigan in Ann Arbor, where I teach. And I began writing proposals to get funding to do research in Ukraine. And um, so that was uh, that was 2014. 
So I, I wrote my proposal. It had to be polished. So, you know, I consulted with my tribe, my colleagues and my friends read multiple drafts. Then I submitted it. And of course, it's a long waiting process while your application is approved by two governments when you're applying for a Fulbright grant. Mm -hmm. So months of suspense and waiting. And then just as I was expecting to get the answer about my funding, Russian tanks rolled into the Crimean Peninsula of Ukraine. And I was devastated because, firstly, my friends and colleagues from previous research were fleeing for their lives or facing imprisonment or worse. And so I was very concerned about them. And then also the... Um, you know, the prospect of not being able to do my research because it wasn't going to be safe by any stretch of the imagination to go to an occupied foreign territory of Crimea, right? At that point, it was it was occupied. So, you know, I really feared the worst. I couldn't sleep. Um, I was, uh, it felt like a huge setback. And then I received word that um, I could have the, the funding to do research in Ukraine. However, I could not do the project that I had spent a year outlining because I wouldn't be allowed to go to that place. So mm -hmm. basically they said I went from having a plan for a project, but no funding to having the funding, and no but plan. now needing a project. Yes, and needing no a plan. Ain't the universe That's just a bunch of fun? <laughs> <laughs> That's that whole don't be married to outcomes thing that we talk about. But boy, that that is a sucker punch. I exactly. mean, I, you yeah. know, as somebody who who we, we Chris and I have both written books and obviously you're an author, that whole prep period of proposals and all that is exhausting. Mm -hmm. And then to find that rug pulled out from under you, I mean, clearly the world situation at that point was was much more dramatic, but you wanted to tell a really important story. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that the story you eventually told in your book, Everyday War, may have been even more important and something that you didn't expect. Yeah, that's a really valuable observation. And truly, you know, I had to let go of my previous agenda. And, you know, I've heard I've heard both of you speak about that, too, that letting go process, because I couldn't control the occupation of Crimea, but I still had the power of my pen. And that's what I went with. That, wow. I, I'm going to take that. I'm going to I'm going to make that a soundbite <laughs> and, and listen to that. I couldn't control the occupation of Crimea. OK, but the power of my pen. <laughs> That is talk about a perspective and a and a perception of what is really in your control and what is it. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that you know um, you talk a lot about um, like figuring out what is your skill set and what do you bring to a situation. And in my case, you know, I I think that the anthropological skill set was very transferable into the situation of war. And I think about anthropology as basically the transferable skill of empathic listening. So mm. once I let go of that previous agenda, it, the project began to very quickly take shape just by um, listening very carefully to people and, you know, learning through their stories learning through my own experiences in Ukraine. And um, that is how I went about writing Everyday War. You know, it's really, it's such a valid point that you just made that when we can, Kristen talks about looking through things, uh, things through a brilliantly resilient lens. When we can change our lens, that lens that we are seeing things through, we often our vision expands sometimes exponentially because it allows us to see things that we never thought of as being not only important pieces of the story, but maybe the actual story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Absolutely. how did that happen for you and, and take us on. So, okay. So you didn't have the plan at that point 
And how did you go about this whole listening process? Like, where, where did you even start? I mean, you you have this plan all figured out. Where did you even start now that you know, okay, I can do this, but what the heck am I going to do? You know, um, I learned through stories and experiences. And so it was a matter of going there and starting to talk to people. And one of the things that most surprised me was, you know, I went to Ukraine thinking that I would find um, victims of war crimes and recipients of humanitarian aid. And those two things are important. But what was even more important when I began my research was that I found people who were engaging creatively, consciously, strategically to protect themselves and their loved ones. And so that became the story, right? Was the 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 ways in which Ukrainians very actively engaged in what was going on around them in ways that really enabled them to become resilient um, and not just survive, but also to thrive. And one of the reasons that I was so excited to um, speak with you today is that you know, Ukrainians have been enacting the exact process that you describe in your writings about um, rising to resilience, but and this idea that that resilience has to be learned. And I think in the Ukrainian case, it was really learned in quite terrible circumstances. So I'll give you the example of Mirabel. Mirabel didn't want to leave the conflict zone in Donbass because she had just finished remodeling her apartment. And it was a huge accomplishment to, you know, get all the supplies and choose the fabric. And the results at the end were something that she truly treasured. But one day she witnessed a person get very seriously injured in a mortar attack and her whole worldview had to shift. And, you know, she told me with tears in her eyes that she realized her apartment was no longer the most important thing. And that was the beginning of her shift. Um, Or there was a woman named Alina and she had a comfortable home life. She was the wife of um, a, a, a doctor was simply, you know, raising her two kids or maybe not so simply. But anyway, once the war came, she found new purpose, new direction and new meaning in life by becoming like a humanitarian social worker and assisting people. And so, you know, you talk about um, being resilient together, and that was crucial for for Ukrainians. Um, I talk about that resilience together as like an everyday ethic of care. The idea being that, you know, in a situation of war, when the, um, you know, Western philosophy is largely useless, you have to improvise, right? You have to improvise your own ethics. And you have to determine for yourself what's right. And um, another great example would be um, Yulia. You know, she asked me rhetorically, do I cook for the internally displaced in the shelter or do I cook for my family? And pretty much Ukrainians uh, all over the country made consequential choices that were based on their perceptions of others' vulnerability. And so relationships, I think, are crucial to resilience. You know, you're hitting on so many, um, so many points that are so important, as you said, this process of, of brilliantly resilient, but what you said, you know, we always say that, that you can look at this as a, whatever happens as a burden or a brilliant starting point. And, and your three examples right there, I mean, they made that switch from burden to a brilliant starting point to something else. But when you say, and this is what I want listeners to understand that, okay, if, if folks are listening and thinking, well, our, our country isn't in a war, you know, I'm not in that war arena, you can insert, you just said, um, once the war came, like they were living a certain way. And then once the war came, 
they had to they had to switch and then they went in this different direction. You can drop in anything there. Once the divorce came, mm-hmm. once the diagnosis came, like that's that that moment of, you know, we say train wreck, people there pretty much had tank planes and everything else wreck, right? Mm-hmm. But you can really insert whatever is your war happening right now. Cause let's be honest. I mean, my divorce was a war. I mean, I had to be ready for war going into that protecting kids and all. Some, you know, someone that just received a medical diagnosis, that is a war with their health right now. I love that you phrased it that way because you can insert whatever it is that's happening Mm -hmm. and then look at that through that lens. Help us understand this though. How is it that, that these, these folks that you're using as examples, were they, were they immediately able to, as they're looking around, just look through a different lens and switch gears that they, was there, did you notice something amongst all of them that have they been doing this their whole lives? I mean, is it something innate? Is there a, a characteristic that was similar with all of them? Mm. Well, you know, that's a really wonderful question because Ukrainians have been through other wars on their territory, right? In the way that Americans have not. And so I would say that on balance, they tend to be very resilient and and sort of, I guess, for lack of a better term, ready to self-provide, right? They couldn't for years, they couldn't really rely on the government. At the beginning of the war, they couldn't even rely on the military. And so I think that there is an inherent resilience, but it's also important to note that every person had their own process right their own sort of trajectory of what was the what was the turning point for them and i you know i like what you're saying about um being able to insert any you know perceived tragedy in life as a starting point because one of the things i tried to understand while i was there was the Many people who had lost limbs didn't have prostheses. And I tried very hard to understand why they had not, you know, was was there a shortage? Did they not want one? What could possibly explain this? And so I started talking to soldiers that were demobilized and off duty. And what they said to me was two very important things. The first important thing they said was that uh, Ukrainians don't really, um, they don't like to complain. So that's one thing, but there's something that they don't have that in common with us, do they? (laughs) (laughs) We are very good complainers, we Americans. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I think the thing that's even more important though, is one of them said to me, Greta, when they wake up in the morning and they realize that they're missing a leg, that's not the most important thing. They get to live another day. They're alive. That's what's important. That's what they're focused on. They get to feel the sun on their face, feel the breeze, and know that they get to live another day. And I found that was especially true of people who had seen active combat a value placed on an acknowledgement of the terrible, terrible loss, the incredible destruction, but also the value of human life and and their lives. Wow. You know, very easily, like like, uh, Mary Fran said, Americans tend to be quite the complainers and the blamers and the, you know, falling into the victim mindset. But I've, I've all, always said that my dad, who was in the Vietnam War, and, and you know, people always say to me, how are you so deliriously optimistic all the time and so hope-fueled? And I'm like, I was raised by someone that said the Vietnam War was one of the best things in the worst of times that ever happened to him. And and he lives in what you're, what you're reiterating, this, this level of gratitude that even with all that he saw and his friends that were taken from him in that war, he was grateful every day. He still is. To, to be alive, to have his life that he has. And that is such a, it is such a core element of resilience and being brilliantly resilient, being able to move forward, being grateful. But what I'm also hearing is it sounds to me 
Um, and this is what I really want to, to land with folks that are listening. It sounds to me like the, the Ukrainian people as a whole with all you would think that they would have like victim story after victim story, you know, with all that they've been through. But it sounds like they take full responsibility for their lives, themselves, their families and and making a go of things no matter what happens. Mm hmm. Yeah. So the title of the book, um, Everyday War, like the, the term everyday war just refers to these conscious and deliberate ways that people engaged conflict. And there's just so many examples, you know, like um, Alexandra is a good example. She was displaced by the war. She had to drop out of university. And but she wanted to drop out of university because, as it turned out, her father went back to fight in a volunteer battalion. And the challenge was that he didn't have the supplies that he needed for fighting. And so Alexandra took it upon herself to every week go around, collect donations and buy him the supplies that he needed. It started with boots. It went to tactical gloves and proceeded to camo gear and night vision goggles. And I call it everyday war because kinship was something that had become tactical. And the, the distinction between combatants and non-combatants was being rapidly eroded. Alexandra knew that the people in her father's sites were potentially their former neighbors or her friends, but the value she placed on his life was paramount. And so she decided that she was going to provision her father, you know, and at 22 years of age, right? Her daily life was not going to university or, um, you know, having romance, having parties or friendships, but provisioning her father. And, you know, there's countless examples throughout the book, which I sort of, you know, I try to tell it like, through people's stories, mm -hmm. um, because that's how I learn best. And because I think it brings the sort of human dimension of it into the fore, um, which is which is also important because, you know, in the literature on war and conflict, personal relationships are usually treated as the tangents or the backdrops to the real action. But, you know, for uh, Alexandra's father, it was absolutely crucial what she was doing for him. Hmm. You know, it's so interesting to me because the one thing that really struck me about this, just this particular story, was the proximity. She was able to get those things to her father because the war was right there. You know, we in America have never experienced that. You know, the war is always over there. It's always, you know, somewhere else that the fighting is taking place. But I, you know, I can imagine your worldview. You know, Kristen and I both have had those experiences. Kristen with the birth of her sons being blind, me with my son and his uh, addiction that have been those before and after moments. You know, mm -hmm. there's this pivotal moment that just changes the way you see things. And you mentioned earlier about the value system. And, and that's what we say all the time. Those kinds of sucker punches take you back to your most basic what's important. And that doesn't mean that, you know, having a lovely apartment or being able to be a kid and go out and have parties, all those things are wonderful. But when you're in that crisis period, that's when you figure out who you are. Mm -hmm. And it sounds to me like that's exactly what happened with a lot of those people that you had the conversations with. You know, you live a certain life and then something happens that your core values have to come to the foray. And it sounds like a lot of their core values were based in service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mary Fran, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because, in fact, those exact words are in the book. Oh, so people <laughs> said so. No, so many people said to me. You know, my life is divided into before and after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's and and I think obviously, you know, everyone has their experiences. Kristen said you can call it your own war, but clearly they have had the most extreme form of that. But to see that that those concepts carry through no matter the situation, that it's before and after, and those are the places where you get to define them yourself. I mean, I think that can be, but the point can be made that that is what you can look for in those moments mm -hmm. for what's really important to you and then act based on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you know, of course I'm wondering here, did you always as a young girl think, I want to go to the Ukraine or someplace <laughs> like that and ask people about these kinds of stories <laughs> or I want to be in, you know, foreign aid. Help. I mean, you do service at a mega level. <laughs> Were you raised in a family of service? Where did this, where did this come from? You know, I was raised in a very diverse environment because the grade school that I went to was uh, basically fed by graduate student housing, university housing. So I went to school with the children of graduate students from all mm. over the world. And it was wow. always changing. And I loved that. And I started to feel very at home when I wasn't at home because I just loved getting to know people who were different from me, right? Who maybe were just beginning to learn English. And um, so I think that I, you know, over time I was able to translate that into a career of anthropology because I began to truly appreciate the value of, you know, the empathic listening that I was mentioning earlier. And I think for me, you know, I place a really high value on bringing forward the kinds of stories that we wouldn't otherwise hear. Like, I feel like that's my, you know, my gift is to tell the story that nobody else can tell, um, either because of my experience in a place or, you know, because of meanings that I'm able to glean from something that someone has told me. And I probably the best, that probably sounds very abstract, but the best example maybe that, you know, I was at a picnic once in, this is in Ukraine, it's probably 2017. And there was a, a young man there who, as soon as he learned that I was, you know, based in the Detroit area, was just dying to talk to me. And so, you know, we sat down at a picnic table with my tape recorder between us and pretty soon he took my field notebook and started sketching. The reason that he wanted to talk to me was that Detroit is the birthplace of his favorite car, <laughs> the, the Cadillac Eldorado. Oh. I, at that time, did not know what a Cadillac Eldorado oh my God. was. I had not been paying attention. However... We connected, right? We connected over this place and this car. And the longer I spoke to him and the more carefully I listened, I realized that he was grieving the loss of his collection of matchbook cars back in Donbass. Well, that seems odd. And in fact, when he was interviewed by the UN, they said, go buy yourself some new matchbook cars. He's but probably going to be highly offended because it's matchbox cars. I right. only know that. <laughs> so clearly you are out of your element in that conversation, I was. weren't you? <laughs> I was. However, here's the thing. I listened to him for a really long time. We scrolled through his phone and I gradually realized that the cars on the shelf at home, the reason that he grieved them was that they were everything the cars in his real world were not. The cars in his real word world were incinerated, crushed, bombed, broken, tireless, and the rest. But he was holding on to this image of these perfect little cars in their perfect little boxes on a neat little shelf at home because it provided him with a little bit of a, a psychological reprieve from the reality that he was actually surrounded with. And wow. so- that's what I mean by empathic listening, right? And also what I mean by mm, my purpose being to tell the stories that either otherwise wouldn't be told or or can only be told by me, right? The, the fact that I came from Detroit, the fact that we met at this picnic and we connected over this topic is I think like the beauty, it's the beauty for me at least of anthropology, right? Is that you get to surface those stories and that understanding that might not, that might be, might otherwise escape. Well, and, and I think that the, the, um, the word understanding, uh, new information, like I, I believe I did a, a collection of stories or people, of people that are blind and, and successful in this world for the same 
reason. You know, I believe wholeheartedly in, in the uh, a universal thing we have in common is loving storytelling, right? And learning from stories. But we don't know enough stories. We don't have, people don't have information about the stories that you're telling. They don't have the information of people that are actually thriving with blindness. And, and so a lot of this bias, most of the bias comes from either lack of or the wrong story that's mm-hmm. been told, right? Like I keep saying, people have been telling the wrong story about blindness for 50 years. Now it's a, the new true story. But storytelling is really what what changes people's minds, opens them up to to new ideas and new people. And it's, and it's across the globe. And, and what I also love too, in, in terms of the storytelling and, and your experiences of knowing all these other diverse stories from growing up, you are making me so much, not even happier, ecstatic that my daughter has landed uh, for college next year with mul- she had multiple offers to go to a lot of different places. She's very blessed and talented. I was getting nervous though, Greta, that she, most of the offers, when we went to those campuses, I said, Carissa, everybody looks like you. Everyone has had almost probably the same house as you, the same family experience as you. Like, how are you going to learn anything about other people? Not that there's anything wrong. She's had a, a very blessed and happy life and all these, all these other people were wonderful. But I thought... There's just such a bigger world and and diverse types of people out there. So she actually landed because of basketball, not because we were looking at demographics or anything at a university that is is only an hour away from our house in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. There's only one other girl from Pennsylvania that will be on her team. The majority, I think it's 75 percent of the school is from other countries. And I thought, oh, what an experience she's about to have. Mm hmm. Mm hmm all those different stories and backgrounds and points of view that I see as just so much more important than staying in, in one little bubble of everybody's the same as us. Yeah. It's interesting that you tell that what you just mentioned about people telling the wrong stories about blindness. And I think that's, I'm really intrigued by that because I feel like there's also a lot of stories about war that aren't the whole story, right? And that's why I chose to focus on so much on like relationships, but also uh, care um, in this book. And, you know, you mentioned um, one of the like uniting threads as you listen to people's stories about blindness was like how much love and care there is in the world. And that was so crucial to me writing the book. It was such a point of learning for me. And I think perhaps the best example of that is this guy named Pasha, who, you know, his house is destroyed in a mortar attack. He flees with his wife to the complete other side of the country where they start to rebuild an old shack with the materials that they can scrounge up. And Pasha was just devastated by his experiences. But gradually, the neighbors started to drop by and ask what they needed. And soon, things like spare doors, windows, canned Mm -hmm. tomatoes were being dropped off. And paradoxically, his fear of being bereft of support and dispossessed was alleviated by being Mm. displaced instead of exacerbated, right? He got, he emerged from the war with this idea that no matter what happens, there will be support in some form available. Mm. So it was a real revelation for him. And I think it was a revelation for me too, how much support is available in the war and just how much people rise to one another's assistance when it's truly necessary. You know, it's Mm. really funny this, uh, as you're speaking, I'm hearing over and over and over again, this one thing that we talk about in being brilliantly resilient and it's people think that big problems always require a big solution. And that's never the way it works. 
Mm-hmm. You get the big problem and then it's little piece by little piece by little piece that you get to rebuild. And it sounds like that's exactly, you know, I'm thinking about the the story that you told about the young girl provisioning her, her father. And this story right here, it's a pair of gloves. It's a can of tomatoes. It's, you know, it's a window, it's a door. It's, it's those pieces that allow us to rebuild and rebuild with a level of intention and integrity that may be missed by the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those, those little things that can end up not only rebuilding a community, but rebuilding a soul and rebuilding faith and rebuilding, you know, the, the will to go on and rebuilding resilience. And it sounds like that's something that you encountered over and over again. It was Mary Fran. And I'm really glad that you brought up this idea of, you know, little by little things get done. I I really like that. And it's also why the word every day is in the title, because I feel like it's a deceptively simple term every day, but the every day is precisely that little by little that you're mentioning, right? We can only live our lives day by day, little by little. And I think that, you know, in a war zone, the everyday is an accomplishment, like being able to reestablish a sense of normalcy, a sense of stability, um, the hope that life will go on, uh, you know, just oftentimes getting reconnected to electricity, finding food, all of those things become very big accomplishments in a war zone. And so um, I really like what you were just mentioning about one thing at a time instead of a big, massive, you know, solution. Well, I think too, um, we just had an episode where our guest was talking about bit by bit, right? The little bits at a time. But I think, I think what's really important to pull out here is all of us can do something bring a can of tomatoes, right? When when I say drop in whatever is happening right now, your your family member or your neighbor got the diagnosis, the divorce, the something, whatever that big thing is, you can bring a can of tomatoes. You can be the person that just sits there and listens. Like every one of us can do something little that adds up to the reset and rise for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's that whole idea then of, you know, becoming a tribe, whether you want to or not, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I think our most valuable connections and relationships are often the ones that we're not looking for in the first place. And because in that situation that you're describing, when everybody is brought back to their most basic, and that's where you can make those human connections, which really at the heart, where you spoke about relationships or relationship building early, That's the strength of community. That's the strength and the foundation of of resilience and a strong, you know, a home, wherever that may be, and and in its personal space and in the larger space. So Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your perspective Mm -hmm. for that, because that is one of the basic truths of Brilliantly Resilient, too. You know, making that value system and making those connections and acting then based on that. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, you know, I agree with you 100% about the connections that are important all are not always the ones that you expect. Sometimes it's a connection that you didn't uh, predict or anticipate that becomes very, very important. And I really saw that in my work when I looked at relationships, because you know, some some relationships became microcosms of the conflict when families were split between um, Russian and Ukrainian sides. So one woman said to me, she said, Greta, people are like bombs, a single word and they can explode and that relationship can disintegrate. But by the same token, this is why relationships are so important in war they can, you know, people that you don't expect uh, can become very important to you. And I I guess, you know, the story about Pasha and, you know, the spare doors and windows illustrates that concretely. But the thing that's always true is that relationships have to be reconfigured. 
Um, and so I talk about that sort of as a, a sort of an intersectionality of different kinds of relationships where people had to reevaluate both what was important to them and who was important to them. Mm. Um, there was a young woman I met who was a newlywed. And when the war started, you know, she she had a difference of opinion with her new husband. She wanted to evacuate her parents to Ukraine. He didn't. He wanted to stay in the Russian controlled territory with his. And mm. so they divorced. Wow. So, Talk about families at opposite. You yeah. Know, family oh, yeah. divides. Literal. Mm. They were like families were sometimes like microcosms of this war, right? The war did not stop at the front door, which is why I have the the cover. I don't know if you can see it or not, but um, it's a picture of an apartment. And then there's a landscape on the outside. Mm. And the, re the reason that's important is that it, it communicates that idea that war doesn't necessarily stop at the front door, especially mm -hmm. in a war where there are, you know, violations of international humanitarian law and residential areas become targets. But the reason that the, the cover is, is interesting is that, you know, you, in most of the pictures of Ukraine that you see, it's from the outside looking in mm. to those apartments mm -hmm. and those destroyed buildings. And this cover set, sort of tries to say, hey, wait a minute, what does it look like from within, right? Mm. What does it look like from within this military microclimate? And that's where book, the book takes its readers, is into these relationships that became so fundamental, you know, for everything from food to first aid and beyond. Wow. That's, that's a, I, I love the stories behind book covers because it is so hard to choose a book cover to convey what that entire, all those tens of thousands of words. That's brilliant. You know, you're, you're um, in academia. I'm wondering if you know the book, the talent code as a Daniel Coyle, I think is his last name, but in this um, he talks about why are there, why are there certain parts of countries like that produce they always produce mega winning soccer players or they always produce like, why are these kinds of things happening? And he has this concept called ignition where it's that if she can do it, I can do it. If he can do it, I can do it. They put themselves in the other person's place and story. And what I'm, what I'm loving about your book and sharing these stories of resilience in a place that most of us, it would be our worst nightmare, right? In a war. And it's like, this book is the ignition for the rest of us, for those that read it to say, if she can do it with her war in war that's happening, well, with my war that's happening right now, then I can do it. If he can do it, I can do it. I love that this is a whole book of stories that is igniting folks to their own reset, rise and reveal. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Thanks for writing it. Oh, yeah. I, I really enjoy sharing it with readers. So it's um, it's great to be here and um yeah, thank you. Well, where can we get it? Can, yeah, oh, sorry, where, sorry. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. So now <laughs> tell us where we can find the book so that everybody can get a piece of, of this brilliance. Uh, you can order it on Amazon or pretty much anywhere. Books are usually sold. Um, you can also um, order it um, at Cornell University Press directly. And if um, your listeners are interested in finding out more about my work, they can go to my website, which is gretaeuling.com. Um, and that would be a good way to, you know, you could find out about my previous books and find articles. I'm going to be starting a newsletter. There's uh, pictures there. Well, good. Please let us know. Keep us abreast of all of that. Let us know and share it on our Facebook community because we really do want everyone to get this message, take this message to heart and um, maybe find something in common with people that are across the world and are in circumstances that are very different from us that we can very much learn lessons from to incorporate into our own lives. 
Greta, thank you so much for being with us. This has been a wonderful conversation. I, I My eyes are wider opened than they've been in a long time. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful sp speaking with you. you oh, too. Thanks so much, Greta. Thanks everybody for, for tuning in. And we want you to go and check out all of Greta's uh, links that she mentioned, get the book, uh, read those stories and ignite your own journey into resetting, rising and revealing your brilliance. If you need additional resources for that, go to brilliantlyresilient.net, sign up for the brilliance bit, our most popular freebie out there where we come into your inbox once a week, every week into your email inbox, giving you a less than one minute read, less than one minute, people. We do not do hard things here. Life is hard enough. It's a less than one minute read to keep you living brilliantly resilient. We'll see y'all next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Brilliantly Resilient podcast. Join our Facebook group and follow us on YouTube to be inspired with tools to reset, rise, and reveal your brilliance.